Hello everybody and welcome back. Here's again Captain Sidaris. And your seven. Hi folks. Joining us again is the developer team of the Wing Commander 4 Remastered project. Hi guys. Hey. Hello. Hey. Well, I have to say congratulations to a successful release of your first demo. How do you feel? Tired. <laughs> Exalted. The enthusiasm was... is, is pouring right into my ears. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try and add a little bit more, a little bit more, in, you know, emotion into this one. Now we feel good, actually. It's, uh, it's just been a lot of work to get even, even to get us where we are. I know the last time when we talked about this, we said we were kind of in that whole eighty percent, twenty percent slog, and we ended up coming up more like seventy percent. So there's still a lot of things we need to do ahead of us, but we wanted to get a playable. Uh, piece of software out there and the whole team did just a ton of work to get it to where it is and I, I know there are things that we had to kind of cut at the last minute and things that we still want to add into a like a revised version but I mean we're I think we're all pretty proud of what we put out there so far but I also hear there is maybe a vacation in need for you I, I was racing towards this deadline because we've got another kid on the way oh. so I'm not going to be doing very much over the next year just because I'm going to be doing a whole lot of diaper changing and whatnot. So um, I don't know if a rest is on the cards, but I, I probably um, will scale back how much I'm doing on the project for a bit. I was uh, kind of lucky to stumble on you guys towards sort of the end of the first push here, right? Because uh, I worked on some of the music in the game, or I guess all the music in, in the demo. And uh, I don't know, I joined you guys. How many years had you been working before I came on, like a year ago? Um, so right. Two years. Yeah, I was yeah. Say about that, yeah. I came in for the exciting part, which was nice. And how did you join the team? I honestly don't remember. You know, I'd pop into wingcommandernews.com here and there over the years. I haven't like been an active member or anything, but I must have seen something there. Or sorry, sorry, the CIC site, I think, is usually where I would pop in. There must have been some coverage there on it. And then I reached out to them, and uh, it was just like four or five guys on a Discord, and... Uh, they didn't really have a, a composer or a ta I think there were some people who had done some stuff, but uh, there was still a lot to do. So uh, I just uh, started doing what needed to be done and had a good time. Yeah, I mean, it was a lot of seren a little bit of serendipity, but for sure, we're, we're glad to have you because your stuff is awesome, man. Like, it really is cool stuff, and we're very happy to have you. Uh, you're too good because um, our audio guy, Mr. Coffee. Every time somebody makes a negative comment about the game, he gets somebody to record it just for a little internal um, <laughs> a bit of fun. And just puts on a you know crazy voice and reads out all the negative comments that we like get on YouTube or whatever. You scumbag! Nothing looks remastered. It looks like the original. I should know because I played all my space sims a few years back. Man! Ugly discharge from engine nozzles. Make it more transparent and a little shaky. Now the gas jet looks like a cone from games of the 90s. Very annoying! And we haven't <laughs> had anything about the music yet, so... Uh, oh, they just will. Have... It's just a delayed... There's, there's going to be plenty of detractors. I mean, like I said, I'm kind of lucky that we're not doing three, because if we were doing three, all the music in that was MIDI synthesized. And there's definitely a whole contingent of folks out there who took a lot of pride in their specific MIDI synthesizer setup and how you know good they got the music to sound and back then and then went for those switched to digital audio which was a little ahead of its time because they couldn't really cram enough into ram to make it sound all that good it was mono it's 8-bit the loops are pretty short so it's hard to sort of glorify that awkward phase in the digital evolution so maybe I'll maybe I will be a little more insulated than I would be otherwise. So what you're saying, you're not going to get any negative comments because for Wing Commander Four, there's nowhere to go but up. The music. <laughs> kind of, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> Are any of you guys uh, MIDI purists? Like, did you were you angry when they switched over? I, I don't know why that stuck in my head so much when it happened back in my childhood. Not, you know, I'm like not that I even I didn't even care much. I guess I was already sensitive to music uh, production at that point. I don't remember um, it annoying me at the time. In fact, I, I thought it was an improvement, um, probably because I've never had a fantastic sound card. But going back now, yeah, I, I really struggle with that bit rate. I mean, what is it, like 11K? Um, I much prefer um, the sound of Wing Commander 3 over Wing Commander 4. It's probably better music, and I certainly have more of a fondness for it. But uh, yeah, it was just a little too early, I think. Yeah, 11 kilohertz sounds right. That's one quarter of the 
resolution of CDs. So pretty good. Yeah, I mean a lot of lot of games were doing twenty two kilohertz in, in the late nineties, so sounds about right. Pedro, sadly we couldn't hear you last time we talked with the other guys. Maybe you can give us a little bit of insight how this whole project started. Well, I've been doing Wing Commander modding since I was like 15. You know, when I first you know joined as CIC, and that time I'm stuck with Pedro, which is not my name. It's just a call sign that I can't shake because I foolishly picked it at 15. And yeah, I mean that was just like I mean apart from like a few like Star Trek visual basic um, things. I'd not really done any programming before I started scripting like Wing Commander missions. And so that's probably what um, convinced me to get it into the games industry. And then and that's just kind of gone on with, with other stuff. Um, I, I'm, you know, once I got into the industry, I didn't have a lot of time for that, but I was not doing exactly what I wanted to work on. And this guy called Pete comes, Popsicle Pete, uh, says, you know, hey, I, I've kind of mapped out the graphics interface. Could you just like soup up Wing Commander Prophecy. And so the OpenGL patch just came out of that. But uh, again, uh, I keep kind of drifting in and out of it. And eventually, um, I, you know, I, I moved to Japan. Uh, I loved engine work. And what had happened was, um, especially here in, in Kyoto, which I don't want to uh, leave, I love the area. So I'm kind of torn between the companies which are here versus leaving the beautiful mountains and, and just a good place uh, for the family and everything. And so the company I was working with closed uh, and we had this amazing engine, which I really wanted to show off. So I thought I'll open source it. And I'm just uh, thinking, what project do I do? And I've never made anything in my free time that isn't Wing Commander. So it was absolutely going to be a you know, Wing Commander project. And at some point, I just stopped focusing on trying to open source the engine. I guess because everybody else came on, the entire sh focus has shifted. So it was always like I'd like to have it in the background, moving very, very slowly. Uh, just like the, the dream one day would be to create a Wing Commander 4 remaster. And then all these amazing people come on, uh, like with um, Owen's upscaling and uh, film composers, um, fantastic music and whatnot. Uh, and suddenly it's become an all-consuming, uh, yeah, it, it's eaten up pretty much all of my free time. It's nearly two years since we last talked. So let's go right into the main question of the day. What changed? Yeah, we have the big demo, but I think there is also a team size increase. And maybe the biggest question here, do I also have a mod database page? Well, we haven't gotten around to a mod DB page yet. <laughs> but you remember it at least. Oh, yeah, we remember it um, for sure. Oh, yeah. I, it, it's on my list of things to do. I just have so many other things to do for the program and the project in my day, to, day job that we haven't gotten around to setting it up yet. I would say that's kind of falls under Owen's thing because he's our webmaster, but he'd probably throw something at me if I said it. I was so. staying very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that probably would be my purview wouldn't it as define says i'm sure i'll get around to it it's just there's so much going on um that probably would be my responsibility weirdly i'm um, talking about the project in general this is the first time really i've been involved in anything anything modding um i've always had an eye out on, on graphic design and video tinkering but this is the first time i've been involved with a game mod so i'm aware of mod db i have used it myself to download mods for other games before but yeah i've never considered setting up something there so it's kind of new ground for me but i'm sure i'll get around to it well, I just had to ask, since in the Star Trek community there are many gamers who say it's the best page and it wasn't in our last show, so yeah, I had to ask. Well, fair enough. I've got a mod DB page open right at the moment because um, I'm keeping an eye on the Blue Shift extension for Crowbar Collective's um, Half-Life 2 remaster. So yeah, I do, as I say, I do touch on mod DB always as a downloader, never as a creator. I'm sure I'll get there. Now, in Owen's defense, we had made a conscious choice originally to try and keep this down low, only because we didn't want to attract undue attention from EA until we had kind of figured out what we wanted to do, you know, and how we wanted to approach it. But I think now that we have an actual playable product out there, it, it makes sense for us to move in that direction. So, Also, I think any intentions we had to keep things low-key have probably been kicked in the shorts by the uh, PC Gamer writing an article about the demo. So. <laughs> well, there is that, yes. 
<laughs> I'm not exactly sure they sold the project because PC game was like, oh, you know, the, the terrible cheesy acting, the worst you've ever seen <laughs> yeah. from all of these guys. It's like <sighs> it was a mixed review, wasn't it? Uh, this demo looks pretty good, but my god, it's based on Wing Commander 4, and the acting's awful. They really took every opportunity to hammer it. And try as I might, you know, there's some stuff that is now really hard to come back to, and especially like the FMV games of the era. Uh, and everybody was pretty much on top form. You know, there's a few weird lines maybe from Mark Hamill, but, you know, by and large, it was incredibly well done. So it's a shame it's to keep hearing that it was all so cheesy. I don't think it was. Cheesiest aspects of the acting are the what I would call the loop groups, the uh, the, the 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 sort of extras they hire to sort of to, to provide additional audio, like like in the background. For whatever reason, I felt like that was at a level that wasn't at the level of the other actors. Like this is really specific, yeah. but like in the in the opening cutscene when there's like somebody when Tolwyn's preaching to the council and there's somebody off screen yelling "murderers" in like a very <laughs> dramatic. <laughs> Boy, it's I don't know if that really pirates, I tell you. Right, right. <laughs> Stuff like that. I, I don't know. I don't know what they were thinking. Yeah. No, it doesn't run through the whole thing. For some, you know, the one scene you think they'd get right, and the worst one for me is um, the woman who shouts out, uh, "And now they attack us!" And they used that in every single trailer, and it's incredibly and then they it. bad. Yeah, it's incredibly badly dubbed. Owen was telling me that uh, like somebody thought they sounded too much like uh, Cobra. And so they put on a completely different voice. It just doesn't match um, the mouth movement at all. I guess when it's like 320 by you know 160 or whatever the old video was, people wouldn't notice the mouth mouth movement as much. I don't know. However, that alternative um, delivery or original delivery is in the original television ad, which we modified. And I used the yeah. take from the actual game. If you go back to that original delivery, it's really weird. She's put her inflection in a strange place. And now they attack us, which doesn't sound right for what's going on in the scene. So, you know, I can see why it happened. I mean, for me, the worst acting by far is prophecy. Like, <laughs> yeah. mean, you know, like, you know, Hamill was, you know, like that bit where Casey rolls in and says, like, you know, after he gets freed from the Nephilim and he's like, you know, hey, I'm sorry I let you hang out there. And then, you know, Hamill just sort of like spacely says, why? You saved my ass. And he sounds totally like a surfer dude right there. And I was just like, that is the worst delivery I think I've ever heard. I just went back through all of the games and uh, I was reading the manuals as I did it. And the manual like confirmed that um, the order was that or the ending of Wing Commander 3 was the one where Blair goes off with Rachel. And then you're watching Prophecy, and um, Rachel is hitting on Casey right after her um, her ex has been uh, kidnapped by the uh, Nephilim. It's just... Um, yeah. The yeah. writing for me was... Uh, yeah. It was just weird. I, I remember Rachel being really just poorly written in that game. Just no... I think there was like one scene where she talks about her past, maybe. Yeah, I don't even think there was that. And there, yeah, there was zero interaction with uh, Blair. Uh, it was it was strange. And why the hell did they make her so angry? Came out of nowhere. Yeah, I mean, she was, well, I suppose a breakup with Blair. She's now floating around with her ex. So. No, that's a fair point. Sue, she hates enough to go out on the pool the second he disappears. <laughs> And, and this whole the graduate vibe with Casey was just a little off too. I mean, Casey's like what eighteen or supposedly something like that. I, I always thought she actually looked quite old to begin with, but yeah, that looked weird. To quote our favorite detractor, very annoying. <laughs> and then the, just the story disappeared. Like it was strange because I, I was doing this complete replay from like um, action stations all the way to secret ops and it's just like that all of the cutscenes just kind of drop out at they the stop, end of right it almost makes you yeah. wonder if they cut a bunch of material because maybe there was more of an arc for rachel maybe there was a reason for her anger and then they just cut material in order to save on um, production costs i would there think that's um, probably accurate uh, there was um actually some missing scenes that, um weren't in the dvd version um uh and they weren't actually on the CD version either. Um, the, the movies were there, but they would never play. But there were extra greetings from Rachel. Uh, I don't remember if they were any kinder to you uh, than the ones they left in. I mean, we can accuse Chris Roberts of many things, but being 
an incompletionist is not one, one of them. <laughs> yeah. I, I imagine that there probably was an arc there somewhere that probably got dropped. It's easy to imagine. Well, well he, Chris Roberts had gone by the point of prophecy. I mean, that was the main problem. Like there was nobody to replace him. Like the, the yeah. space flight was so much better. But, um, you know, gameplay was good. The level design, the level board variety was better. Everything was fantastic except the one thing that Chris Roberts cared about. Nobody was really there to take over. Going back to the demo. Was it a big success? How did you enjoy the feedback? Not had that much feedback. I'm glad because when things go wrong, you, you always hear about it. Maybe it's a mistake that we have people contact us through the forums. So, so we did have had new people sign up specifically to talk about it. We've had one bug appearing on AMD, but mostly it's all been positive. Positive uh, about uh, music, uh, positive about controls. So yeah, apart, apart from the bugs, I don't think we've had many complaints, which is quite promising. Can you elaborate a little bit more on this AMD problem? Because lately I hear a lot um, of people from projects having problems with, with AMD for some reason. Do you have any idea what it was going on there? It's um, This all came originally of wanting to use my own engine, which is still a good because I can't really do that work in a day. Um, it's a good way to like just stay up to date. So using the Vulkan API, which is very, very complex, and it's easy to make mistakes. Um, that said, cannot see anything that's wrong. Uh, I've got all the validation layers on. I've been looking in render doc, and everything seems set up correctly. So it, it's I'm going to keep looking into it. Um, but unfortunately, if, if there's a driver-specific issue, it's always AMD. So there's always that thing going in the back of your mind. Is this my fault? Or is it a driver issue? Yeah, yeah. Um, this is exactly, exactly what I meant because on other projects I hear similar things, and I'm just wondering: aren't they good enough to to do do proper drivers? Uh, what's going on? I find this rather weird because they are actually not not newcomers when it comes to graphics cards. It's working on the Steam Deck, right? I saw your tutorial video, uh, Owen. Yes, um, we got some assistance with that. Um, yeah, it works absolutely fine on the Steam Deck, which of course is all AMD hardware, as far as I'm aware. Yeah. So yeah, go figure. And it works so on I... some AMD hardware, so it's a it's an isolated cases. I guess this is maybe a bit of a I don't want to be negative, but I'm 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 surprised there isn't a bigger sort of um, fan base than there is. Like I almost feel like, I mean, I know that's just sort of maybe context of my own biases and how much I love the franchise, but it seems like a lot of games just in general of that. Aside from maybe the LucasArts games, there are a lot of games from that era that I, I mean, for me personally, a lot of the Sierra games that I loved growing up, the Wing Commander games, like a lot of games that just don't, that kind of just sort of fizzled out of the, the zeitgeist in a way that surprises me. Anyway, I don't know if you guys feel the same way about that, but I'm, I, uh, it's probably good for the demo, right? Because if it was a really immensely popular franchise, then EA would be all over it. So the fact that it, is sort of, in a way, a little bit lost to history means maybe we can actually finish the project. But still, well, I'm still yeah. generally just a little surprised, I guess, of just that there aren't more folks sort of excited about it, just because, again, for me, I mean, I, I just, I'm just biased. I just loved it so much as a kid, so. I mean, first of all, uh, like, EA has always been quite good with that stuff. Like, even when Wing Commander was still possibly an active franchise, they never tended to set, uh, shut down fan projects unless they were doing something you know, it was in direct competition with them or, uh, you know, they were doing something like you know, posting um, copyright material or something like that. So they, they don't tend to be too bad. I don't think they shut us down unless they started remaking Wing Commander 4. You know, fingers crossed. I think the idea it's... of tying it to the original mission scripts is brilliant, like really making it necessary to own the game. That's such a good plan. Yeah, my dream is to knock Free Space 2 um, out, uh, down on the charts. Um, if you look on GOG, um, you know, good old games, uh, page 2 is where all the space combat stuff starts. First one is Free Space 2, and the next one's Wing Commander 3, and then it's Wing <laughs> Commander 4. So they're, they're all on page 2. It would be really nice to, at the very least, just push Wing Commander 4 above 3, because uh, that's not something that would happen naturally, because 3 is the, the more loved uh, entry in the franchise um, and just you know maybe show there's still some interest in it which clearly there is uh, if they've you know uh, if it's that high up on the best sellers 
Yeah, I mean, Wing- I, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to ask if Wing Commander beats out TIE Fighter or next wing on um, GOG. I think he does, yeah. Nice. But, I mean, you also have to factor in the fact that, like, X-Wing and TIE Fighter is also available on Steam and Origin, so they have multiple channels, whereas I think Wing Commander... Well, Wing Commander's available on Origin, too, so I, we'd have to look at those sales. But I think it's a good and noble goal. To the point where, where we're having maybe a, less of a reaction than, than we would anticipate, I actually, given the amount of interaction that I see on, like, the CIC and, you know, related to modding in general on the, disc, on the Wing Commander CIC Discord site, like... I think the fact that we put something out there will re-spark interest in this sort of a thing. Because it's been a long time since anyone's had anything new. The last two major projects that were going on for in the Wing Commander space were uh, Flat Universe, which is unfortunately now defunct, and uh, the Secret Ops model update pack. I don't can't, and can't think of anything else that was... You know that kind of bubbled up to the surface from like a fan community modding thing. There's a ton of artwork out there, like re- like really good artists out there doing that kind of thing, doing 2D art and 3D art. But as far as actual playable in your hands stuff, I think those are like the two major ones that at least come to my mind. And so the fact that we actually put something out there, I think, will start engendering more interest. I mean, the organic comments that we're seeing on YouTube are, you know, hey, when can we see this? When can I play this? Like, this is great. I want more. And so I'm excited about that particular part of the feedback. I think, you know, if we can get something out there that's, you know, that's enjoyable and playable in our time, you know, in, in a respectable amount of time, you know, you know, I think we'll start drawing some more interest and we might actually hit that goal of pulling, you know, Wing Commander 4 up over free space. So, you know, that's just my perspective on it. And maybe I'm just an optimist. But I mean, again, the organic comments that I'm seeing, a lot of them are, this is really good. I mean, you know, there's the negative Nellies out there who say, this is never coming. But... You know, that's the bottom half of the internet for you. So. Exactly. Yeah. One, of, one of my favorite comments was uh, just somebody saying they remastered this exclamation point question mark, and I'm like, and I, which was sort of nice to see because it, that that vague they made it seem like oh, like EA came in and did this. This looks as good as something I would expect from the main creators, which was kind of a nice thing to see. Now that the main, uh, the most recent EA remaster is Blade Runner, that that kind of makes us look a little bit better. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh yeah. Do you have any plans on somehow can continuously giving this some updates? Because I have seen the um, community spark up for a while. For example, uh, in the Star Trek gaming community, when uh, GOG released a few games a few months or a year, I don't know, um, ago, and there, it was 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 kind of a hayfire. It came really hard and was down really fast. And I, I guess one of the reasons is because there was nothing new coming out over and over again. Do you have any plans or, or strategy to, to keep this this ongoing more interest? The main reason we want to keep interest, I think, is just to get new recruits. So that's really the main reason we keep doing these articles. So I don't think we're like, in a way, we don't want, you know, wide reaching announcements or you know, we don't really want too much awareness of it because we don't want people getting bored of it. You know, I'm hoping that for most people, the first time you'll see it is once we have a full release. And it's just nice to always keep uh, enough updates going out there that we find people like we have been doing to help um, help us put the project together. I, I think um, the, the most important thing is actually the internal team morale, which tends uh, to be someone on the team does something cool and that inspires everybody else. So you tend to see whenever whenever somebody's suddenly done something really awesome, you know, there's a, a new piece of music, um, you finally got something playable, something like that, suddenly everybody's contributing something. So it's more about the internal uh, rhythm, I think, than it is the external. I'm the heart of the operation is what you're saying. Since you That's exactly what we're saying. Men- <laughs> mentioned music specifically. I'll just take all the credit. Uh, <laughs> and no one said anything about the art this entire demo, so I'll just I won't take it personally. It's fine. <laughs> so so no, essentially I mean, well, you will be releasing a CD with the music next. Well <laughs> technically it's not even my music. It's George's music and uh I'm just the conduit through which it's uh passing and becoming better. But um we're, we're remastered, not better. 
But hey, I'd love to. Yeah, if we ever finish this project, um, there'll be a lot of music, maybe some new music too. And I love the art for, for what it's worth. I think the art is, the new art's fantastic. I, I love seeing all the new de- all the details on the ships that uh, you know you always imagine are there. It's the perfect remaster, I think, from a visual standpoint because you know it you know it doesn't feel like a new product. It just feels like the pristine version of the product that we that we think about when we think back on it, which I think is the way to go with a remaster. Um, so I'm I'm a big fan of the art, and I think and I'm hoping that like yeah, it seems like all, every aspect, every team is sort of has that same perspective. Don't change the things that worked. Make improvements on the things that are there. I think I think it's the right headspace. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, seven to your your question earlier. I, you know, we do plan on keeping you know incremental releases coming to help keep the community engaged. I know that we're planning a, a revised version of the existing demo to add in the features that we didn't manage to get in on the first pass in order to meet our deadline. And so we wanted to, do, you know, I know there are things. Just you know, there's some graphical updates we want to do. There's a couple other features we want to build in. So, you know, we're going to try and get that done. And then really kind of like the next big chunk of work for us as a team is to figure out how the atmospheric flight works. Because I think as we can all attest, right, the on-planet missions in both 3 and 4 were probably the weakest parts of those games. Because it was essentially just the three-dimensional space flight with a giant plane. And you could, you know... It crash into the plane, but you could also like hover upside down less than two inches from it forever, right? You know, and not have to worry about physics. So, um, you know, I think those are that's kind of the next big chunk that at least Pedro and I have to start tackling is how does this work from like an engine perspective and how does it work from a graphical perspective? What do we want it to look like? How do we want it to behave? My, my big goal for that is just to not have every planet at night. Um, just because I didn't want to do a sky, you know, there was no way to do volumetric clouds. It was just every single planet you just happened to land on at the night so they could just use the same sky box. Yeah, and my goal is to make it feel like you're flying in an atmosphere, right? So it's interesting that the art guy is talking physics and the, the programmer who does the physics is talking art, but, you know, it's a, it's a good partnership. We work well, and so, I mean, you know, we want... You know, I mean, we're, we are noodling around ideas on, you know, how much wind resistance affects the ships and stuff like that, right? Like, I mean, I don't think we're going to go super detailed. We're not looking at, like, Microsoft Flight Simulator here, but, you know, we want it to feel different. We want it to actually, you know, be a different experience when you're a pilot. So that's kind of the next big chunk. And you think you will add this to the demo, or is this farther down the road? We're talking about um, the demo will just be uh, polished um, so that we can just say, you know, this is what the cockpits will look like, this is what the uh, controls are, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, et cetera. just to say, okay, the fundamentals are okay. We would like to, after that, I think we were talking about releasing just up to the end of the tier uh, campaign. So that would include an atmospheric mission, but that would not be a demo, that would be the first part basically up the full game so you would need the game to play it i believe earlier someone mentioned um in a continuation of this 80 20 rule you assessed it would be somewhere 70 to 30 was that um at the time when we did the interview or is this the current state that you say well we need another 30 percent which is the hard part to be done for me, it's just sort of an estimate of where we are right now. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I, I think we wanted to do initially, we're hoping to get more of the, you know, guts of the engine built out, but, you know, life gets in the way. And that's fine. You know, it's, it, this is, you know, a fan project. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's, it, it's important that it is still fun. And as long as it uh, progresses, I think that's quite fine. I mean, I have also a bunch of projects laying around which I should finish at some time and life gets in the way but at some point you really stop and as long as something is progressing you're fine I think yeah we keep nibbling at stuff and it's interesting when we add a feature how you know kind of like digging into the ripple effects of that right like the original mesh mode caused us some a little bit of consternation early on. And the funny thing about it was that, you know, when we had originally designed like the 3D assets for some of the capital ships, we sort of did it Mark One eyeball and not really use the original meshes as a guide because we were hoping to make things, you know, scale differently, look differently a little bit, you know, just, you know, tweaking around the edges. But when we actually came to implement that with the original game mesh mode, 
we ended up having turrets in weird places. And so, you know, we had to go back and do some rescaling, or at least I did, you know, to make those, you know, work better. And so it's interesting how some of these, these knock-on effects happen. And what's even funnier is that, like, the mesh dimensions that are in the demo are actually different than the mesh dimensions that are in the actual game itself. So, you know, that's why, you know, if you'll look at our, you know, our fact, when we, we give you the option to look at, like, the original mesh mode and start playing with some of the, we call it the OG mode, but, you know, uh, you can play with it in the demo, but it's an, it's an incomplete feature simply because the scaling is just totally different in some cases. And also, like, the demo never had the Lexington in it to begin with. It was always the Intrepid. And so, you know, if you switch to the OG mode, you'll get the Intrepid as opposed to the Lexington. You know, there's some deck stuff that kind of hangs out in space and things like that. You know, stuff like that when we're working through a game, you know, and we're doing things, we're like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if? And we all say, yeah, that's definitely cool. And then it has knock-on effects, and so that's kind of, you know, a, the story of the demo right? <laughs> in many aspects is kind of doing those things. So, in a way, um, it's also simply an, an ongoing process to see... Um what sticks, right? So you have an idea, maybe this is cool, this should be fine, and you, you test it and you find, well, looks cool, but has some some side effects, I take it. This is what's yeah, going on there. If we were agile, I'd say it's constant iteration, but I, I'm not sure how we would define our development methodology at this point, Pedro. <laughs> I don't know what we call Fragile? I don't know, like cowboy? I'm not Positively sure, but... uh, chaotic. <laughs> I would say that is it. But uh, a great example of what you're talking about is like when the new cockpit came online, and because Defiance hasn't been praised enough, um, it does look fantastic. But yeah, I mean, just uh, adding these cockpits has been a huge learning experience because um, you, you know the original games, it's just like a 2D image that doesn't really have to sit and exist in the world. And when command of prophecy, it's just a bunch of fake structs which is just around the ship. But this is a full cockpit right inside the object where like all the shadows have to line up and all the rest of it. And trying to get the convergence point where you're looking down at the point where the lasers will actually um, all line up. All of this was an absolute nightmare. And of course, Defiance uh, just got the new cockpit to me like a week and a half before um, we would you know, due to shut down, and we almost didn't put it in. I mean, it looks fantastic, and I'm really glad we got it in. But, yeah, it was, um, <laughs> it's, it's always stuff like that. Like, the stuff that was done in the original game, it's already been proved out. It, it's stuff like the cockpit that didn't exist um, is where we are making problems for ourselves. Yeah. So I have to ask, is, is there anything that you would say you had decided earlier that will have to stay the way it is, but actually you wouldn't do in this fashion if you had to do it anew today? Is there something that you wouldn't redo in this fashion? I'd keep better notes, honestly. <laughs> like, No, seriously, like, like some of the stuff that we did when we originally proved out the concept to work, you know, like how we positioned turrets and what we did, you know, and, and some of that stuff was like two years old. And the notes that I took at the time probably made sense to me then, but they weren't necessarily nearly as fulsome as they needed to be. So when we would go back and like redo the Lexington, for example, you know, it took four or five iterations just to remember how to put the turrets in the right spots. And you know, how, how we went about it, because, you know, Blender has empties, and, and we also use, you know, armatures for certain things, and how they all tie together and what they mean, right, and how we do them, and how we implemented them back in the day, just, you know, some of that stuff was lost to the history, and so Pedro and I, towards the end, had a running joke that, like, if it didn't have 10 iterations, it wasn't good, right? Like, so, you know. But, you know, we've kept better notes now, but yeah, I would it would have saved us a lot of heartburn if I had uh, done it, you know, two years ago. So it's some sort of uh, lesson learned. But uh, I can tell you in my company, you will be happy uh, if you ever find notes. So you are already further than some, some professionals. So you're doing fine, I think. <laughs> uh, otherwise, I mean, I, I think like a lot of this is just learning as we go. But I mean, would I do anything differently or would I take a feature out from the demo as it stands today? No, I don't think so. Like I said early on, I'm very happy with what we've put out there. I... It needs some polish, but the bones are really, really good, and and I think you know all the stuff that we put in there deserves to be in there. 
All I was going to say was just been on the music front. Um, we do have some ideas for ways to expand and um, expand on what's there. And I guess we're not exactly sure how far we'll take those ideas. I remember there was another musician involved early on, and I don't, I'm not sure what happened. There was one conversation thread where we talked about throwing in like pop music from the time and coming up with what would Blair be listening to in the hangar bay versus the officer's lounge. And we were sort of getting a little geeky about it. And I think, I don't know, maybe at least even having gone down that road, I don't know if it's like this for art or models. Sometimes you sort of have your spitballing session where you think of every possible thing you could change. And then you sort of pair that back. to like, well, what do we really need, you know, to, to, to improve on what's there. And, and sometimes you don't really need most of the ideas that you had, but maybe one or two or three are, are really good. And so you keep those. Is that sort of similar to the way you guys work when it comes to art? And uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I, you know, I mean, we try and Pedro has been very consistent about our, our, you know, our art philosophy going forward, which is make it look like the full motion video. And if you don't have the full motion video, make it look like the high quality renders. And if you don't have that, then, you know, use your judgment, you know, and so that's a good guiding principle. But yeah, I mean, you know, there is, could we go, you know, 10 million polys and greeble everything? Yeah, we could. But then, you know, would it look like Wing Commander at that point? You know, no, it might look more like Star Citizen, which is kind of what we're trying to avoid, right? We wanted to make it look like, you know, how we envisioned as children, right? Or as, you know, young young adults in some cases, my own case, I'm not trying to date myself, but like how, how it would look, you know, like, you know, we used our imagination because, you know, I mean, the textures for the time were, were really well done and very detailed. But they were kind of mushy on screen just because of compression and everything else that had to go in at the time. And so, yeah, I think the goal is really to make it look like how we imagined it to be. So, yeah, we do do a lot of that spitballing and we say, you know, wouldn't it be great if? And then we're like, well, maybe it wouldn't be so great, actually. You know, It's kind of like the writing process, right? Well, I had an, a creative writing professor in college who said, you know, write, write everything down and just remember that 70% of everything you write is crap and the 30% is good, <laughs> Right. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. It's yeah. simply put the de- development. This is what it is all about. This is what I meant. You you will throw it at the wall, see what sticks in. If there are still parts on the wall which are not being hit, then well, throw again. Yeah. I think the the true art of it though is figuring out what is the good thirty percent, right? You know, yeah. I mean that that's really where the art comes in, and and your own personal judgment is what what of the thirty percent is actually worth keeping. And you have to be good at that because if you're not, you end up spending a whole lot of time on stuff that you don't need. And that's not a good use of time when you when time is precious. So being good at identifying that 30% is both good creatively but also an essential skill for just getting this dang thing done, you know? Yeah, for sure. And we are lucky that, I say lucky, but um, because we've kind of uh, chosen to use the original mission scripts, it keeps us in check. Because there's so many things that we might say, oh, we should try this, we should try that. And it just it keeps us very laser focused on this is what was in the mission. And we're not going to make anything new. It's certainly on the code side, I feel like most of the temptation has been taken away from us by that choice. Except when we're talking about the, the atmospheric missions. <laughs> well, that, we're going to get ourselves into trouble and, there. <laughs> yeah. But again, that, that's, um, that is something new. That's how it plays. We've already played around with the, like, the physics and all the rest of it. I was really happy to go back and play like the 3DO version of Wing Commander 3 uh, and find out that clearly the programmer who'd worked on that felt exactly the same way as I did because he had taken you know the foundation uh, of Wing Commander 3 PC and suddenly you were sliding, you had momentum, and you could do the Wing Commander 1 style turns where you would just uh, you know, hit your afterburners, turn around, and face back at the enemy. And we haven't taken it quite that far, although I'd love to experiment with that. But yeah, uh, in terms of how the game controls, we're being quite free there, and obviously there's some experimentation. And I'd like to do more experimentation and try taking it a bit um, further in the way that uh, that 3DO port did. And yeah, again, for the atmospheric missions, um, same again. But we're not like going in and adding new ships or, or new waves of fighters or anything like that. I never played the 3DO port. It had its own engine, didn't it? It was not the same engine that the flight engine that the PC used. Is that correct? I don't know. It felt totally different. And the way it handled was totally different. But it was apparently done internally um, at EA. 
uh, by Origin System. Yeah, sadly, uh, the guy who headed it up, I think Pete Shellis, had died. I was so impressed by it, I was thinking, I'm going to reach out to this guy and just say, that was an amazing port. But yeah, I, I loaf seemed to think it was at least originally based on that code. But me looking at it, it looked completely different. Maybe I'm getting them back to front of my head, and it really was um, uh, completely well, different. No, I mean, it had a physics... I mean, sp- the, the Respace engine had physics built in, right? Because didn't they also do Strike Commander off of that? Using that as Radar. the base? Yeah, I think um, it was the same yeah. one. Well, back then, probably an engine was more the idea of throwing polygons onto the screen, and uh, you would think of the actual motion of the planes and whatnot as gameplay code. So yeah, it's, it's absolutely plausible that somebody just went in and went, oh, I didn't like that in the PC version. Um, I'll just go and add it. But enough felt different to me that I assumed it was a new engine, but I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's it's always a question of uh, what has been done, actually. I mean, you know, the, the philosophy, this the ship of Theseus, when you remove every part of, of, of a ship and replace it with something else, it's still the same ship. And for code, it is very similar. If you are refactoring a lot of it, at some point you will see, of course, there are similarities, but actually it's something completely different. But when you have been there step by step by step by step, then you know it is actually the same code, but it doesn't look like it any anymore. The wing commander of Theseus. Yeah, yeah, kind of. Could very well be that they redid it entirely or that they just changed so much uh, around and that it really feels and works differently. I mean, for them, it's the very same thing. It's, it's work in progress. You learn a lot over time and think this can be done better or differently, or I want this to be done differently. And eventually, it, it is differently. It's simply progress. Yeah, I haven't looked into the uh, the 3DO at all, so I couldn't speculate, but I have looked into the PlayStation, and that was definitely the same code. In fact, it was so similar that when we were experimenting with Wing Commander 3, Owen took all of his file names from the PlayStation version because he could convert the PlayStation video. So he just retook the lookup movie index file from the PlayStation version, just plopped it instead of the PC version. It just worked. So I'm pretty sure it was... You know, it must have been close to being identical, and we can load the, the missions, which is one of the things we'd like to add, one of the things Lowe suggested, because there were different missions. When there's a ground-based mission on the PlayStation version, he couldn't run those missions, so it had alternatives set in space, like uh, instead of going down to the planet, you will go and rescue somebody from a space station. And so we're actually looking at loading those and... It will, there'll probably be an option to just play the PlayStation version of missions instead of the PC. I'm not that deep into Wing Commander 4 community. Are there a lot of custom missions, so to say, so that you would kind of have to support what the people did there too? I've been trying to write it so that we could, and if somebody overwrote the stats, then it would obey the overwritten stats, so you can just change the file and it would work on the original game and the remaster. That said, I don't know how many people will make use of it. Um, There is a mission editor. I can't get it to work on a modern version of Windows. There are stat editors. But where most of the work was done in the Wing Commander community was Wing Commander Prophecy, just because it was the last, well, Secret Ops. Um, being the last game had been released, and so that got the most attention, and it had a much better mission editor. So probably not too much. If we were remaking Prophecy, then it would be a big concern. Going back a little bit to the demo, I played it yesterday basically a lot, and I wondered how many waves are there? How many ships can you basically fight? I think it's unlimited, but the uh, it'll just keep spawning various waves of ships. I think the current high score, though, I think is 19, keep me honest. I think 19 under ace conditions. And then uh, Owen has the unbelievable record, I think, of nine Stormfire kills only. Uh, yeah, that's insane. Like, I don't know how he did it. I, I swear he hacks, but <laughs> yeah, he did it. I think I just got lucky. I'm still not sure I've got Stormfire stats exactly right because it said it had like um, infinite fire rate or something like that, or fire rate of, of, of zero. So I assumed that was just running at the maximum frame rate, whatever that was. But it never really feels like the Stormfire feels so weak. And I apologize for that. I'm still trying to figure out why. 
talking about the difficulty, what does it change? The ship stats, the firing rate? I went back to the original guides, in fact, for everything, for the um, uh, for how damage is applied to your ship and, and where it comes from and, and uh, what systems get damaged on what side. Went back to that, and again, they have um, fantastic... I think they must have just gone to the programmers because um, the Wing Commander 3 and 4 guides basically read as to how to recreate these games. So they tell you exactly what happens. On rookie mode, uh, they will halve the damage that you take and they will double the damage that you dish out to uh, others. And I think... Um, just give me two seconds. I think I actually wrote down a brief list Yes, so every pilot has a skill level of 0, 1, or 2, and based on the difficulty that you select. Oh, I'm uh, uh, sorry, but, uh, that's for his gunnery and his flying. And if you uh, select Ace, it will use exactly the difficulty level that is in the data. But if you select an easier difficulty, it will shift their skill level down. And if you uh, select a higher difficulty, it will shift it up. So if you hit Nightmare, then every single um, ship will behave as if it was an ace. It will use its afterburner. It will never miss. And uh, I think as the skill level increases, more pilots, uh, or I think all ships at the highest level, all aces, and everybody becomes an ace at the higher skill level, will use full guns which is a lot more devastating, and uh, the frequency of missiles, the frequency of decoys, all of that stuff um, it changes based on their skill level. I also noticed that you included a switch from the original graphics to the new graphics. How hard was this? As a non-programmer, I can't imagine how this is done. The graphics actually one of the easier pieces because we know what kind of data to expect and people had already e extracted that before um there's a guy who works on the wing commander toolbox sadly I haven't heard from him lately um but he gave us pointers on how to extract the textures and then polygon data was really simple uh it's you know it's really just positions so bringing those back was actually quite simple uh, if you want to take it a step further and start bringing back uh, classic engine flares and uh, uh, engine flames and classic particle effects and so on, then we might have to do a bit more work. We haven't really discussed how far to take it. Right now, it's kind of a mix and match, you know, classic models, but modern effects. You also mentioned that there were some features which you had to cut because of the time limit. Can you maybe tell us? what those features are? Anything important we maybe can even see in the near future? I have a list of basically everything we still need to do. But for the stuff we'd like to experiment with in the demo, um, um, Ben, you had some extra examples that I was missing. Yeah, um, I mean, I think we wanted to do uh, the cockpit less mode, like, you know, the original 2D plane, so you could play it yeah. like the original view. There's a couple of graphics things that we didn't get in, like, uh, you know, revised engine exhaust meshes and things that we didn't get out in time. Um, ugly discharge from issue. engine nozzles. Yes, the ugly discharge from engine nozzles. <laughs> Very annoying. And so we have... I'll have to play that sound file at some point for this group because I think you'll get a kick out of it. But um, anyway, so uh, a lot of it's graphics passes, just polish, you know, kind of some spit and polish there. There, Like, we do want to do some feature set changes, like the, the 2D cockpitless mode. I'm trying to think of what else we have on that list. Pedro. Oh, um, yeah, um, the rest of the list is, like, background planets and stars just because, you know, it's just a skybox at the moment and we're going to need those kind of background items. We're just 2D bitmaps before and we want kind of proper 3D uh, background items. Yeah, uh, as you say, improved engine flames, particles, maybe a lens flare. Um, the com videos, we have managed to extract the PC version. Owen keeps telling me how desperately uh, we need the PlayStation version. Yeah. Uh, if anybody knows anybody in the PlayStation homebrew community that can help us reverse engineer this one file that seems to have all of the comms videos in it, please let us know because uh, we're stumped and um, doesn't even have like a file index table or anything that we can see. Do you want to talk about what, uh, the difference of the comms? 
Sure. I mean, the PC version of the comms that pop up in cockpit chatter are higher resolution than the ones you get in PlayStation, but they're all black and white. Um, what happened in the original game is your HUD would be a different colour depending on which faction you're flying for. So I believe it was uh, green for Confed, blue for Border Worlds, and red for when you get into the Black Lance stuff later in the game. And those black and white videos would just be colour tinted to match that. Whereas in the PlayStation, they were all full colour, but unfortunately they were all considerably lower resolution and they ran at, I think we figured out 7.5 frames per second, which is more of a challenge to upscale or to remaster. But what we basically figured out is the loss in resolution and frame rate is easier to handle on my end with AI remastering than trying to AI colorize the black and white versions from the PC. What I've come up with is kind of a process where we can use AI colorization and then I can, in After Effects, layer some glitch effects over there, some CRT scan lines, a couple of things that look like um, like, like digital compression artifacts from the communication system. That would be your in-universe explanation. But um, we did a brief experiment with just cropped out one of the PlayStation ones from, from a, a Let's Play we found on, on YouTube. And that isn't, unfortunately, enough to create a full set from. And it means we've got some compression and some extra scaling issues that have been introduced by being, rather than coming from original source material, they're being played back in in engine. So the ideal scenario would be to be able to extract the actual image sequences from the PlayStation release. That gives us the best opportunity to produce the highest quality eventual remastered content we can. But as, as Pedro says, so far we've hit a brick wall in actually getting those extracted in the first place. I think I'm probably the only person who actually liked the green tinted video from the Wing Commander 3 comms more than the full colored ones from oh, I definitely agree with you there. I, I prefer them because that, that's my memory of playing. I always played on yeah. PC. But looking at the material and, and trying to be as, like, take a step back and be as, as open minded about it as I can, the material I can produce from a remastered perspective is, is just flat out better from the PSX. For sure, uh, for sure. I, I, I'm not trying to step on your uh, territory. Not at all, no, no. I'm just surprised. I, I just, I actually find it amusing that I prefer the, uh, <laughs> like I said, the, and I, and again, I'm not even, I think it's Wing Commander 3 that I'm thinking about, which had the green tinted ones, right? Or had it like, as well as, on the PC. Or right. had it as well. Okay. But if we could get the color information, I was actually pushing for us to kind of keep the tint but just have the hint of that color behind it. So, you know, you would have your color information, but it would do like a matrix style effect when you're on confed, you know, everything would get kind of washed out in green uh, and so on, which was potentially the answer to the, the terrible colorization that the AI did. But unfortunately, the more tests we've done, the worse the colorization, uh, the automatic colorization is, so. Yeah, the AI um, stuff has a particular... I mean, we, we, I took some footage from the PC version that were comms that came from uh, Naismith, who was the... What would, what would you guys call him? The carrier handler. who You know, the guy who waves you in, says you're free to land, that kind of thing. And in shot, you can see his entire face as a background, and the AI has absolutely no problem colouring that. The problem we had was when we looked at, for example, the enemy pilots who have a helmet on. Uh, and this is all tiny, tiny resolution. Like I think max um, 120 pixels is what we're dealing with in terms of a resolution. And they're wearing helmets. You can just about see their eyes. And the AI has absolutely no idea what to do with that. There's not enough information there for it to read from to apply an applicable color effect or, or, or model to it. So what you end up with is it just starts flashing all kinds of weird colors all over the place because it doesn't have anything to work with. So getting hold of the the PSX versions, which actually has that genuine color data in there, makes a massive difference. Unless we find somebody to just by hand color every single frame. I don't know what the fan project equivalent of the intern is. A slave? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I believe in the last interview we called it donkey work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, guys. On that note, I actually have to run. I have to help my wife with um, our new son. So I'm going to head out. But uh, it was fun to hang with all of you and finally meet you. Uh, well, hear you. Thanks for Thanks. being with us here. It's great. Yeah, take care. Nice thanks. So thanks take for care. having me, guys. Thanks take care. Much. Yeah, thanks and have a good day. So, guys, if I understand this correctly, there is no hidden co op mod. <laughs> no. Damn it. <laughs> you in the co op modes. You in co op modes. No. Um... <laughs> 
Uh, I keep actually, you know, I I keep hammering multiplayer too, and I think at some point Pedro's just gonna get tired of me, get on a plane from you know Kyoto, and just beat me about the head and shoulders <laughs> with a daikon. <laughs> My my answer is always um, the same with these things, and it's um, if you can find somebody to help us out, then great. And it, it wouldn't be caught because that would mean changing the missions, which just weren't worth based around it and all the rest of it. But we could have custom missions that we specially created to have co-op. We could have head-to-head. But once upon a time, uh, when this engine was originally created, there were like six of us working on it, and now I'm wearing the hat, physics programmer, and graphics program that one i'm quite comfortable with but um uh, ai programmer uh, we hopefully have a new ai programmer who has joined the team we'll have to see but yeah i'm just wearing all these hats already one programmer is not really enough uh, for all of this uh, especially once you add online so if you can find them i'll put them to work there you go captain sedaris find us an additional programmer and you can get your co-op mode Oh, I have now a goal in life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm picturing how he uh, was born. You know, when you're born, you, you get slapped and you start crying. And in, in his case, it must have been different. He came out and uh, asking, "Will there be any co-op?" Nurse says, "No." <laughs> Captain Sidaris is born. The nurse slaps him, and he says, "I do not engage in PvP mode." <laughs> <laughs> But you mentioned something I also wanted to touch, the team size. How big are you now? We're plucky and small. (laughs) Well, but at least you increased the size, so at least there is something. Yeah, we've added a couple members of the team, you know, each contributing in their own way. I have just recently managed to rope in the art skills of uh, a person you know, Captain Sedaris, who's Feckler Targ, of course. So I'm glad to have the help because... Honestly, there is still like about 300 different meshes and things that we still have to do in order to support just a full release. And so, uh, you know, any help is is good help there. I know we pulled in another web programmer to help out uh, to do things like online scoreboards and such. And of course, you all met Greg. I don't know, Pedro, who else? Who else do we have? Well, Mr. Mr. Coffee. Coffee. Um, Yeah, basically, we have one programmer, one audio guy, one music guy. Uh, one website slash AI upscale slash UI guy. So Owen's wearing a fair few hats there. But yeah, that's about it. So we have, as I say, hopefully got a a new AI programmer. Um, But, uh, you know, it always comes down to real life. One of the the things with uh, fan mods is you just have to kind of wait and see as people, you know, become acquainted with just how much time uh, how much of an investment of time it is. You you never want to count your chickens before they've hatched. So I think I would say the confirmed members are um, those five, and everyone else we will just have to hope. So no new organizational um, challenges there. You know, <laughs> having to confer with a lot of people. Uh, no, no. Um, still pretty... Uh, um, small number of lines of communication and talking about communication how do you work together you mentioned before we started this is basically the first time you hear each other so how is your day-to-day work we we mostly chat on discord yeah usually by text and i would actually say actually the the release um date for this demo was almost identical to an internal uh, demo we had and we're all work work from home at the moment and we try and do lots of voice work. And I think, actually, because of the time zones, we don't have any choice. We have to um, work via text. But it means that messages don't get lost. People don't misremember what you said. So it actually works quite well. Um, yeah. Just communi- communicating by text. So and classic ICQ if, approach. If you, if you at somebody, they're going to see the message. They're going to get to it later. So, yeah, it definitely works that way. But is there also a GitHub in the background or some sort of organization tool? Uh, yeah, we have um, a Git server with um, you know uh, the, you know the project task board and all the rest of it. And we have uh, you know general design documents floating around and whatnot. Interesting. I wouldn't have thought doing a big project like this in that way, but 
Saturn, you're more the tech guy. I'm just a nurse. No, I, I think I have a very similar experience. As long as tasks do not require you to to actively work on something right now, because sometimes you need help with something, you have to show it to someone. And if you can do this one on one, it's quite fine. But if there are three or four guys, then things get complicated. And doing this via ICQ, Skype, uh, Discord, whatever, can be tricky. Yeah, and yeah, I think I, I think the project itself is not life or death right it's not our day jobs it's not our livelihoods so stuff that you know we do can wait <laughs> yeah of course i mean it's it's not like there's some publisher with a clutch behind you and where are the results here it's not yeah, like it that. might be nice if they paid us but you know <laughs> i will kind of stand by i mean it is possible to over manage projects and to lose so much time in meetings and all the rest of it yeah. um if you can keep your uh, lines of communication organized, ideally you've only got two people communicating on a given task, and with a team this small, that's exactly what we can do. Yeah, I mean, as I say, we have to schedule everything. We, we, we have our project task board, and we have all the priorities um, for all that stuff. But, yeah, uh, I think there's a, a trap a lot of projects fall into, which is just to overmanage, and there's just so much wasted time. Yeah, I think this is something that has been discussed also in the professional fields. I don't know if you know the book, um, The Mythical Man Month. I, I think I read something similar as you just pictured there, because at some point it's more management than doing the actual work. And I think everyone in IT knows certain situations where this is happening. So I can totally understand this. And I, I concur. At some point, you just have to let the people do their job. They are not stupid. They are not monkeys. Otherwise, you wouldn't have hired them. And same goes in, in, in a, 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 a fan project. If you have a problem with someone working, then you're doing it wrong already. And if you trust the guy, if you know he's doing good work, then the worst that could happen is, well, it has to be changed or it went in a different direction somehow. But especially in your case, it's not a big issue. You know, There is no, no real deadline here. Yeah, I mean, once you're dealing with a larger company, I mean, I've worked on games which are 200 people, or, or um, I think it was 100 people pull on one pro uh, project and then another 100 on another in the same engine. And there's no getting away from management in those kinds of circumstances. But yeah, we just, when you only have one person in each discipline, uh, it's just really easy. Yeah. There's definitely a benefit of our team being so small. I think. We may have mentioned this in the last interview, actually. It allows us to be nimble. As Pedro said, you know, if you've got one person in each discipline, you know exactly who you're asking for an item or an asset. And uh, everyone knows where the blocks are, really. I mean, luckily for us, that doesn't really happen. Nobody's hanging around too long waiting for other people. But we know who to expect content from. We know who to turn to to request a particular asset or uh, some production. So the communication is really quick and efficient. And uh, not uh, people contradicting one another. I, I know from personal experience that it can be a real problem when two people are responsible for the same task and they really hard disagree with one another. And this can get get you into trouble because this fighting doesn't really produce anything. And in fact, when those two begin to work against one another, you are indeed trouble. So it's it's really easier if you have a really flat structure, most definitely. I'm going to be a contrarian just for a little bit here and not to say anything negative about anything that's going on here. But sometimes, like, my day job is management. So boo, everyone boo, hiss, hiss. I'm an IT manager by day. <laughs> boo. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. Big stones, um, small stones. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, Very I mean, my... <laughs> if I float, I'm a witch. But... um <laughs> Anyway, uh, no, but I mean, basically, I try to manage projects exactly how this one goes, right? You're all adults. You all do your thing. But sometimes having a difference of opinion is a good thing. You know what I mean? Like, it's it's good to have two intelligent people have a discussion about the best way to approach something. Because I think we all come into something with our biases, right? Like, I do my thing, my art, my way. And it's nice to have a counterbalance to that. Like, Feckler Targ might say, hey, you know what? You might try this. And it may work and it may not, but if, as long as it's a you know, respectful discussion, I think that that sort of sharing of ideas and, and talent is a good thing. 
Yeah. But yes, yes. It, it can it can get nasty quickly <laughs> if if people are too stuck in their ways. What I meant was is with responsibility when it is not clear who is in charge of this special um, section or task or something like that. If there's some way where that these lines are not clearly defined, then it can get you into trouble. If if someone finally has a say about this, then it's really easy. But if this is not the case, then you might really fall into pits. But as, as oh, long yeah. as, as you can get to the point where there is a decision and it's accepted and it is done, it's just fine. Yeah, agreed. Good, I would say let's come slowly to a close. My last question would be basically, what feature in the demo is your baby where you're most proud of? Um, I can't just say the demo, right? Mm, no. Like in its entirety, because I mean, really it is just, you know, the massive effort of a ton of, of, of a small group of dedicated people to really create something that I think is, is fun to play. Um, all right. But if I had to pick one thing, Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, I was just, uh, just thinking how, how this would go with your wife or something like that. If she asks you, um, how do you do you like the food? And oh. you are answering, well, it's food, all right. <laughs> this <laughs> just popped into my mind somehow. Uh, what, what's the best about the, that's, the, the demo? Well, it's a demo, right? <laughs> but that's the safe answer, you see, when it's your wife. You always want to make sure. <laughs> In this case, I wouldn't be quite sure if this is a safe answer. Well, uh, you can eat it, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's be it's better than saying you can't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, uh, okay. Go if, on. I, if, I, <laughs> if I had to pick a couple things about the demo, um, from my own discipline, I would say that I was really happy with how the Lexington came out and looks. Like um, for me, like I spent a lot of time on it and in the hangar and just kind of you know dorking around with the little details. And there are still things about it that I'm not 100 percent in love with, but overall, like. I feel like it feels like a home, and that to me is what I wanted it to feel like, at least for the first part of the game, right? And you know, I have to go through the same the same type of process with the uh, the Intrepid, because that's kind of like your more more or less forever home in the game. But you know, I wanted the Lexington to feel kind of familiar, sort of like you know, because we all got to love the Victory, and of course they just repurposed the model in Wing Commander Four. But I wanted you know, I wanted to make some physical differences between the two and make it look like something that's similar but different and very familiar and i kind of like how you know we worked with the spec mapping to make it like really shiny and kind of look new and you know if you get the light at the right angle it kind of glows and so you know I, it's, it's just kind of like a cool looking ship to me and and so that's one of the things i think i was really happy about um, from my own discipline i could speak ad nauseum about the others as well but that's that's my one I can jump in and talk about my discipline then. As Pedro has mentioned a couple of times, I'm, I'm for the most part, the FMV guy. So the trailer that plays before you um, launch into the game proper was my responsibility. And what we decided I'd do there is I, it's pretty much a recreation, shot for shot, of the original EV ad that was released for the game back in 95-96. All the FMV that's in there is an upscaled version of the FMV that was used there that's then been cut and put back in with the very occasional shots of gameplay being replaced by ours. And that's something actually we've discussed for when we come to a full release, is I have suggested that we should do a trailer of our own, something entirely original, because it's relatively obvious from all the media that was released before the game came out originally <clears throat> that they were much more... They were much prouder and, and more confident of the FMV portion of the game than they were of the gameplay, because you hardly see any of it. So if we were to recreate one of the other original trailers, maybe the theatrical trailer, um, you'd hardly see any of the work that all the other guys have put in on this that make it look so spectacular. But to go back to the original question, I think the thing I'm most proud of in that little segment is... Um, I, I can't, for contractual reasons, I can't mention who they are by either their actual name or their prof the name they're professionally known by. But I managed to get someone relatively famous to do the um, the narration and the voiceover, which I was really happy about. Um, oh, and also Mr. Coffee, uh, who's been mentioned a couple of times, our, our audio guy, um, is German. And I've been working with him in the background just recently. We're probably going to release a fully German version of the uh, of the trailer, of the demo trailer relatively soon. Uh, but yeah, I really enjoyed that. And, and getting someone so professional and so well-known to do the narration really made me happy. For me, I think it's mostly uh, been the opportunity to bring the gameplay into this kind of mix between um, Wing Commander 1 and Wing Commander Prophecy. We've kind of inherited 
you know, the modern motion from Wing Commander Prophecy. Um, tried to put in some of the uh, afterburner slides from Wing Commander 1 and 2. Um, done things like uh, um, giving you splash damage if you are too close to an enemy ship when you destroy it. And, and these are just things like, uh, when I was doing my replay recently, Wing Commander 4 was actually the hardest game to come back to. It's my absolute favourite, and yet it was... It did not um, stand the um, test of time as well as Wing Commander 1 and 2 and Wing Commander 3, specifically 3DO, uh, which just had nicer mechanics. And it's also been really nice to bring in uh, the Xbox controls. So I feel like if ever Wing Commander was revived, it would have to be primarily a gamepad game um, because you'd want it on console and everything. Uh, and I spent a lot of time playing with those and I actually got my high scores. I got higher high scores playing with the gamepad than I did with the joystick. So I'm happy with that, and I would love if it meant you know, we, we brought in new players who maybe don't have a, a joystick lying around. So I would say this is the part of the video where we open the mic to you guys. Is there anything you would like to add? Anything we missed? I would like to say thank you to everyone who's given us such positive feedback. I know Defiance was talking earlier about the organic feedback we've got, mostly comments on the YouTube videos, but also everyone at the CIC who's joined our thread there to discuss the demo specifically. It's been spectacular. I mean, we were all really happy with the demo. We we're very proud of how it turned out. Obviously, we're looking forward to taking that further and improving upon it. But everybody has been so nice, uh, had such wonderful things to say about it, how it's um, evocative of the original, it's bringing back memories, it's enjoyable to play. It's been so delightful to receive that it's really boosted my uh, my motivation for the project in general i mean i was i was never around getting down on it but it's it's been really confusing to hear all that i will second that for sure and also thanks to you guys for setting up time you know for us to actually you know chat and get the word out a little bit and you know it's it's not often we get to kind of sit down as a group as you heard right and actually talk about the process and and kind of talk about it with you know other people and hopefully reach some folks who are interested in learning how i mean even if it's not wing commander or, or a star trek or some other thing if it if it gets somebody interested in maybe doing a mod or you know or getting somebody interested in kind of the process and by which we go through then i think it's great for us to be able to reach out and and kind of form those communities so thanks uh thanks to you guys for setting this up really appreciate it don't mention it we're happy to have you here yeah, definitely. I always like to hear about fan projects. It's amazing what you guys do. Thank you. Don't worry, we'll get your co-op mode one day. <laughs> yes. Oh, 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 of course, I forgot to ask. Where can I send the slave to, to work on the co-op mod? Well, the slave can come join us on Discord, and, and then we'll, we'll find a place to put him to work. <laughs> I have to, this meme in my head here. Um, this uh, don't do this. Don't give me hope. So, so Duan, what do you have on your mind for the next five years? Any plans? Mm, I don't know. Putting you to work or something. Uh, I think it's the other way around. <laughs> Let's try. <laughs> Are you guys gonna do uh, like a playthrough of the demo when this comes out? I already did. Oh, okay. What do you think? <laughs> what do you think? Let's get some feedback, live feedback. What do you think? Yeah, sure, sure. I think it's hard. <laughs> I have to be honest, the last time I played a joystick game is already five to six years ago. So it was hard to get back into the controls. What I was missing is the, the control to divert power to the forward shields or aft shields. I can't remember, was it in the original game or was that never an option? No, it was not an option until Wind Commander Prophecy. And then if you look at the strategy guide, they recommend not doing it unless you're like doing a carrier run or something. Okay, and, and mix it up, of course, with uh, X-Wing versus TIE Fighter or X-Wing Alliance. Yeah, did you find the option though to transfer power to your shields in general? Yeah, that I found, yeah, yeah. I, I saw on the website basically the hidden keybinds, which I used many times. What I have to say, the settings could be a little bit more clear. Sometimes I thought, hmm, where can I find what, basically? I, I, we set it up on the gamepad. So it's just like uh, pressing one button will just take you through all the different settings. So if you just press Y, it will just eventually take you to the, um, the power menu. 
and then you just control that with the D-pad. But yeah, we don't have good defaults for the joystick for that yet, so it might help. But yeah, I mean, like, shield direction, it's something we could add, because, you know, clearly it's something that was added to an heir to the franchise. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about it. Oh no, something new! Uh, well, I mean, we do have on our list of things the revised power menu, right? To kind of, I thought we were thinking of maybe doing more of, like, the power ball concept, like, prophecy. Yeah, I I think um, it was Chris Reed, who is the guy sat playing the game in the trailer, uh, made a good point that um, they ha- in order to do that, they had to remove one of the options. I think it was um, d- damage repair in the power menu. So yeah. rather than doing that, I was thinking of doing more of a, a thing where, because r- with, with Prophecy, you have all of these, sorry, with Wing Commander Paul, you have all of these extra buttons that are like lock power on this system so that it doesn't change. Uh, it just seems so superfluous. So I want to try um, just set the target level for each of them and then just have the actual power. So you're almost setting relative power with the D-pad or with the BOV switch or whatever. And yeah, you, you don't f- find you've changed one bar and then all the other bars have changed. So the power control is definitely something I want to spend some time with because that feels really, really dated and really overcomplicated. Do you guys get a lot of um, constructive feedback or just the general complaining guys? Uh, no, I mean, I think at least in the forums, the feedback that we're getting is 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 targeted. A lot of it's revolving around the AMD bug right now, but there's, you know, there are other, you know, comments of, you know, like, hey, can we make this more, you know, more accessible friendly, right? So that's one of the features we've added, right, is increased accessibility options for people who might be colorblind or, you know, visually impaired, those sorts of things. So, I mean, we've gotten a lot of feedback in that vein, too. So I think, you know, it's all been pretty positive. And I also would say it's positive. My feedback of the demo, it's just great to play a game like this again after so many years. Even I died so many times, I enjoyed the two hours I spent. So please give us more. And so don't go there and work. <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay, I would say that's it for this time. Leave us a comment, tell us what you think about the game, and of course, play the game. Until next time. Bye-bye. Bye, all. Thanks, Thanks. for having me, guys.